everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Kitten Lady and Friends. It's my interview series where I'm talking to some of my favorite cat advocates about how all of us can make the world a safer and more compassionate place for cats. I want to thank Royal Canin again for their partnership as part of their continued catology series. Um, and of course, I always have my kitten cam up. So let's take a look at that. So sweet. Oh. Well, I'm really excited for this episode because it's a really special two-part episode that I'm doing. This is all about cat adoption and about the vet care that comes after cat adoption. So this episode is going to give you everything that you need to know about how to adopt a cat and what to do after in terms of keeping them healthy. Uh, so make sure you stay tuned for the second half when I'm going to be talking with Dr. Tanika Bautista and Dr. Uh, Kirk Bruninger. Uh, it's going to be awesome. But first, we're going to talk to someone who I'm really excited to have on. Uh, my first guest is Steve Kaufman. He is the Senior Manager of Adoption Initiatives for PetSmart Charities, where he's responsible for overseeing the largest network of adoption centers in the world. Uh, he and I met about four or five years ago, and uh, he's just an absolute pro who is really making some incredible changes to the way that we do cat adoptions in the United States. So um, I'm thrilled to have him on. Before we introduce him, let's take a look at this quick adoption PSA from PetSmart Charities. I'm ready for every little wonder that we will discover in brilliant sound and vivid color. Oh my gosh, I love that video. <laughs> Hi, Steve. It's so great to have you. Thank you for having me, Hannah. That video is really great. <laughs> I know. It's just so awesome to like picture all of those people with their um, wonderful cat companions at home. So, Steve, you're like overseeing an unbelievable number of adoption centers. I'm wondering if you can kind of set the, the scene for me a little bit. Tell me like how many adoption centers are you overseeing? What do they look like? Um, you know, how does this program uh, work? Sure, yeah, great. So PetSmart stores have a seven day cat center in every store. So over 1600 cat centers are open and available seven days a week for cat adoptions. So literally thousands and thousands of cats are available every single day at a PetSmart location. So it's really wonderful. Some stores have a small location with four or six cats. Some folks, or some stores will have 15 or 20 cats available, but they're available every single day. We call them seven day cat centers because it takes about an average of seven days for a cat to get adopted. The, the sheer volume that PetSmart provides of foot traffic and uh, the pet loving community um, is already there and built in. So they are able to come in and see these cats um, and adopt them right away. And in fact, cats make up about 60% of our adoptions because they're available all the time where dogs are only available on the weekends. Wow, you know, these photos are just incredible. Some of the things that you've been physically doing in the spaces. Can you talk about like, you know, because I've, I've been to a lot of um, PetSmart adoption, uh, PetSmart Charities adoption centers, and there's a lot of different ways that they look. You know, some of them, like you said, are um, just a couple of areas for cats. And then you've got these like incredible drawbridges for the cats and stuff, too. Can you talk about like sort of the different types of spaces that you have available for cats? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the smaller cat centers, the seven day cat centers in every store are a little smaller fixture that. Um, it does allow for the separation of um, the food and the litter. We have them portalized so that they're able to walk through. We have um, get acquainted rooms so you're able to meet the cat. What you're looking at in some of the pictures now are some of our uh, forward thinking innovations. So we're really looking at how do we better utilize the space for cats. And, and we recognize that, uh, as you can see, cats are you know up on perches and they're, they're very vertical. And we've traditionally built spaces that were very horizontal for the cats to go back and forth 
And we've really wanted to expand that to allow those cats to go up and down and have more natural behaviors. As you know, and I, I bet a lot of your, your listeners and viewers know, um, keeping the stress down is the most important. You know, when we put these cats up for adoption, we want to put them in the most calm and relaxed environment. They show better, they want to be adopted, and they're healthier. Um, when you put a cat in a stressful situation, you weaken their immune system, you know, they, they tend to get sick. And so what we're trying to design in the pictures you're seeing are spaces that really allow a cat to act in a natural behavior. And that really makes for a much more successful adoption, a better placement. And we really want these cats to go home once. That's it. We want them to be in a permanent loving home. And, and that's our ultimate goal. So as you see these pictures, these are our newest and latest innovations on how we can provide the cats that space while still providing a good experience for the potential pet parents as well. I love what you guys are doing. And, you know, like I said, I've been to a lot of different um, PetSmart Charities Adoption Centers myself. And uh, this was, I think this one is in Arizona. Um, I love stopping in and meeting the cats there. And, uh, you know, it's so cool because they're they're right there. Uh, you know, you can just go fall in love with somebody, you know, right in front of you. And uh, it is such a such a great environment for them, especially when they have these more open formats. Um, you know, something that I wanted to, to talk about is how big of a difference it's making that, you know, we still have a little over 3 million cats entering shelters every single year. And um, those shelters are not always the most accessible places for people to get to. Maybe they're in a um, municipal area of town that doesn't have a lot of foot traffic, or maybe people are just scared to go to their local animal shelter, or they don't even know what their local animal shelter is. But PetSmart stores, these are in you know high traffic areas, um, shopping plazas, places people are going um, you know, just to buy their dog food. Uh, and then they they show up and they get to see these cats there. So what is the impact on the cats to be like visible in this way? What would you say um, is the difference that that's making? Well, I can tell you that it's made a major difference in, in the entire field of animal welfare. Um, it's really amazing the concept when you think of it and think of the original founding of PetSmart and then PetSmart Charities and the concept that there were never going to sell dogs and cats in the store. And that was a really original concept back in the 80s because back then when you wanted a pet, you went to a pet store, a dog or a cat. Um, and so bringing that concept along and then opening it up for local shelters and rescue groups, not only gave visibility, but it created rescue groups that weren't there before because they now had a brick and mortar outlet they could use that they didn't have before. So truly this, this um, completely altruistic movement, this idea that let's just give this space to the local uh, animal rescue groups that need it, launched such a massive change in animal welfare. Retail adoptions are now a norm. You know, over a million adoptions a year take place in retail environments, over 650,000 of those just in PetSmart stores alone. So that's game changing numbers. These are not small numbers and it's that economy of scale that allows us to really make a dent in that cat overpopulation issue. We're still struggling. We, we have um, gained some grounds on dog population but as you know with cat overpopulation it's still it's still a struggle so having the availability to show these animals to um, the, the pet loving community the average pet smart will see over a thousand customers on a Saturday um, the average shelter wow. I can tell you from running wow. shelters does not and so it offers the opportunity to share your mission to share your vision of what you feel like cat care should be and to really have that audience and, and then of course all the supplies needed to, to have a wonderful long long-term experience with your cat. Um, so really, uh, it, it's really been a game changer, the idea of being able to keep these cats in the store and have them live there. And to the tune of over a million a year, it's making a huge impact. I love that. And I have to say, you know, I have uh, seen some really, really fun videos and heard some really fun stories of people who went into a PetSmart just to like, buy something and then they end up leaving uh, with a cat they've fallen in love with, right? I have this fun video that you guys sent um, that I'd love to watch together of somebody who did just that. Uh, we came to buy dog toothpaste <laughs> and we're leaving with a cat. 
bringing that love to every single pet we adopted, I think, was like really a good feeling. I mean, I, I love that so much. She's like, I went to buy dog toothpaste and now I have this new cat. And of course, what a beautiful cat and looks like they just bonded so much. Is that something you see a lot? Kind of people who weren't even anticipating adopting and suddenly you've roped them into a new cat? Yeah, absolutely. You know, you, you see that a lot because people have a, a mindset of sort of what they think that they want. They have whether they've seen it on a TV show or whether they've read something that says this sort of fits what I think I want. And when they go into the store and they start talking to the experts and they start talking to the volunteers from the rescue groups and the store associates and all the people with the education behind them on pet ownership, they start to learn, you know, my lifestyle, I, I thought I wanted a beagle and I really wanted domestic long hair. You know, I thought I wanted this. And, and then when you meet the cats and you go in and you get to physically hold them, you can't do that online. You can't, you can't, hold that cat and feel its reaction and, and starts to purr and feels comfortable with you. Um, that's when you really, that bond is so fast and that, that bond and that love that happens. And what it needs is that last bit of nurturing and education and support system. And that's what the rescue groups do. That's what the store associates do. That's what you do. You provide those support systems to keep the cats in the home afterwards. Because like any living thing, it, it takes a little bit to take care of. This is not something you just bring home like a TV. There is, there's a commitment. Um, and so that support system is very important when you're dealing with a, a live entity like this. And so I think it's just wonderful that it's a win-win-win for the pet parent, the cat, and the rescue group all come out just with such a win. And then the support system of the rescue group and the pet smart stores after that, it, it, it's just a great combination. Yeah, so I really want to emphasize for anybody watching, you know, these are um, cats who are from rescue groups. These are local rescue groups. It's not like they're, you know, um, cats that PetSmart went out and, and got. They're, they're actually supporting a local rescue group. And so there are these groups who maybe would never have this kind of visibility if, if not for the opportunity to um, utilize the space that PetSmart Charities is providing. I wonder, um, you know, what that's like for you partnering with, you know, all, all of these hundreds or thousands of groups. Um, how does the adoption process work? Is that um, a, an adoption process set by PetSmart Charities or is it set by the rescue group or um, is there some combination? How do you guys work together to, um, you know, create the protocol for adoption? No, that's, that's a great question. We have over 3,500 partners um, that, that do adoptions in store and it, it's a really unique setup that we have. We um, are really grateful that PetSmart has allowed us to use this space, has donated that space to PetSmart Charities so that we are able to find partners to put into those spaces to do these adoptions. And so we really take a, a very agnostic view to the adoption process. We vet our partners to make sure that they are taking care of the animals, that they're vetting the animals, they are spayed or neutered, they are vaccinated, they are microchipped, they have all the essentials needed to be adopted. But we do stay out of the actual adoption process. And we recognize there is a, a wide berth of philosophies within animal welfare and um, the questions and the um, background that some groups want to dig into is very diverse. Um, some groups are a little more protective of the animals because they've been in very bad situations. They want to be very, very careful. They don't put the cat back into a bad situation. Other groups have such a high volume um, that they've really uh, honed their adoption process to a point where it's become very conversational, which is wonderful because that's, that's really where the industry has taken it. Uh, the adoption process to a point where it becomes a conversation versus an interrogation. So we're really trying to find a good match for the cat as opposed to, are you good enough for this cat? So the idea is sure. um, there's, there's a motto that was coined uh, back in the late 90s when we were start, first starting to talk about open adoptions and adoption processes. It was called In Adopters We Trust. And the idea behind that is if you're coming in to adopt, if you come into an animal shelter or rescue, we should probably assume that your intent is good, that, that you really want a cat for your family, that you're not really gonna go through this process to do harm to an animal. And if we go into the process with that mindset, then it changes the whole adoption process from trying to protect the cat from that person to finding out what it needs to uh, make that a permanent relationship. 
and how do we make this work as opposed to are you good enough? So I really think that the, the fact that we stay out of the adoption process allows the group the freedom to, to take the new pet owner down that path that they feel is appropriate and give that information um, to that new pet parent. As you know, you've got, what, about a half an hour, maybe an hour with a potential new pet parent that you've got a lot of information to give, and then you hope that they follow up with the support system of calling you if there's a litter box issue or if a skin issue comes up, following you online and following others online that can offer that advice. Um, but you have a short time initially to, to, to be with them. And so it's really important, and I think the industry has done a great job of learning that if you trust the adopter from the start, they listen to you, they take your advice, and um, I, can, I can almost assure that you've heard this a lot of times, somebody comes and adopts a cat, and they bring it home to their other cat, and they throw it on the floor and go, meet your new friend. And we know that's probably not the best way to introduce two cats to each other. So knowing that the support system is there, after they bring that cat home and there's a little scuffle because they've introduced them wrong, is gonna help them keep the cat in the home. And building that trust is so important. And that's why with these adoption processes turning into what they're turning into, um, it's really building that trust. And that's, that's what we like to see. I love that you do kind of, you take this position of giving the groups the, the space to do the process that works for them, but also that you seem to have this encouragement of like, let's, let's keep up to date on like, what are the progressive practices around adoption processes? I know when I got started in animal welfare, it was very restrictive adoption processes sometimes involved. It was like, you know, a, a home check and a landlord phone call and call the vet and get a personal reference. And like, it's like, you get your FBI fingerprints, not really, but it can feel like, wow. I mean, it's, it's like going to the DMV or something. And of course, as an industry, I think we've learned um, both through just experience and also through research that that does not necessarily lead to more lives saved. And um, so I really, I think that there's so much to these kind of more open and conversational adoption processes. Is there anything else that you want to share on um, like kind of your positions on where those processes ought to go? You know, should we be doing all of these uh, stringent like checklists or uh, what can it look like when we when we trust people and, you know, we just say, um, you know, we're going to do these conversation based processes or what would you say to a group who um, is thinking about taking that philosophy, but is a little scared to go there? Yeah, no, that's great. I think there's two different directions. One, the, the initial um, reaction and sort of the invention of open adoptions was the idea that if they don't get a cat from you, it doesn't mean they're not going to get a cat. It means they're just not going to get one from you. And so um, when you take that to its extension, you learn that the cat they might get won't be vaccinated, won't be spayed or neutered, won't be microchipped. And all of a sudden, the free cat they got out of the newspaper is $800. Whereas in a rescue group for $50 to $100, you're going to get $800 worth of all of that done, the spay neuter, the microchip, the surgery, as well as the support system. And so the open adoption process leads them down that path and it, it shows the person that um, when it's combative or at least when it's a more interrogative you decide as a potential pet parent do i want to do this or do, should i just go get that free cat out of the newspaper and so when you build that trust you allow the conversation to say you're getting the spay neuter and this is the health benefits you're getting the microchip and this is how it's going to get your cat back to you faster um, you're getting the the, the spay neuter and the, the value of that um, and you're also getting, um, you know, as a, as a rescue group, you're building your donor base and your volunteer base and your potential foster base, and you're really building that trust. Um, for the rescue groups that don't, to your initial question, I would say uh, that don't follow these open adoption processes, um, follow the science, learn what's been going on, really. I, I recognize and come from, I started in sheltering in the very early 90s, and, and I recognize why those processes were in place but the science is there now and we've done enough adoptions and we've realized return rates haven't changed when we did gift adoptions. Return rate hasn't changed when we stopped doing landlord checks. And, and so once the science started backing up what was going on, we realized these ideas were saving more lives, they were reducing shelter intake and stress, and they weren't causing high amounts of um, 
danger or risk. And so really what we're talking about is a risk tolerance level, and it's up to each group to determine what's our risk tolerance level and what risk are we willing to take when we hand this animal over to somebody. And again, I really advocate that that open adoption process and that trust building is one of the most important things you can do, because when you have that trust, you're going to have that support system in place and that cat's going to stay in the home. Steve, you mentioned that uh, you've been involved in animal welfare for a long time, and I have this great photo that you sent of you with a cat. I wonder if you can kind of talk about, uh, there it is, um, talk about what's going on in this photo and um, especially relating to sort of the matchmaking process with a cat, because people go looking for a cat, and I kind of think sometimes you choose the cat, but most of the time the cat chooses you. So can you talk about like, Who's this cat and what do you have to say about cats choosing their people? Well, uh, it is true. So this, this picture definitely shows that. This is me in uh, 1990 in, in my first shelter that I worked at. And this cat, uh, Tito, ended up being his name, crawled on my shoulder when I bent over to pick something up and then remained on my shoulder the rest of the day. Uh, and then eventually for 18 more years remained in my life um, and was an amazing, amazing cat. And so to the point of choosing you, um, I had adopted a dog just previous to this, had uh, no intentions in my mind of bringing a cat home. This happened on this day and, and it was a life-changing event. This, this cat changed a lot of lives. I could spend another hour talking about the people and the other animals, uh, interactions that have happened, but that's a million stories that are out there. Uh, literally, these cats are, uh, and pets in general, are changing people's lives. And so um, to, to, to the question of cats choosing you, this is one example, and we see it in the animal shelter world, we see it in uh, the stores happening as well, um, where the bond that's happening when people come in and they start interacting with an animal, no matter if it was their intent to adopt at that time or not, at any given time, you don't know how somebody personally feels or what's going on in their life, um, and animals seem to have that innate feeling that they do and they react. And so I really feel that it's not only that the cat stuck his paw out and you, and, and you, you felt he chose you, but there's actually a, a bond going on that's, that's, a, that's um, beyond that, that I really feel that as you're walking through and you're, you're talking, because everyone talks to the animals, they do. So as you're walking through and you're talking to the pets um, and you're meeting each one, uh, they're reacting to you and they're reacting to your voice and your tone and your influx and your behaviors. Um, and, you know, I've seen the biggest 350 pound football player pick up a cat, not a cat person at all. That cat starts purring, the guy melts into nothing. I mean, it's just, it, it's, you, you don't know the power of a purr until you put that against your chest and you're like, I caused that. I caused that to happen. Um, it's tear jerking sometimes. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's just so powerful and it's, it's sometimes hard to put in words, but um, I just enjoy doing it so much. And I love that the fact of, scale that we're able to do it with cats right now and being able to share that with an audience this size too. So thank you. Sure. Yeah. I think that um, a question that some people who either don't have a cat or are thinking of getting a new cat is like about that matchmaking process. Like to what extent do you think people should have something really in mind before they go adopt or or should they just go with an open mind? Like how, how do you recommend people approach the matchmaking process? Sure, so research absolutely beforehand. And I always encourage anytime you're gonna bring a new pet into your home, extensive research beforehand. We are talking about and have hit on some points where there are some impulse adoptions or adoptions that take place because the bond happened very quickly. Um, there's nothing wrong with those. And, and I wouldn't want those to stop. But that being said, any amount of science and research ahead of time is a bonus. If you're going to bring home a long haired cat versus a short haired cat, there are a lot of differences that you should know ahead of time. If you're gonna bring home a purebred Siamese or a rag doll versus just a domestic long hair, domestic short hair, there are issues you need to learn there too, behavioral traits, nutritional traits, backgrounds. So anytime you're gonna go into bringing a pet into your home, um, and especially when you start getting into uh, cats that have more specific needs, it's really important to do your research ahead of time and really important to talk to other pet owners. 
talk to cat professionals like yourselves and others that have resources online. Go into the stores. PetSmart Associates are well-versed in cats. Volunteers and shelter personnel are on site. They're well-versed in cat behaviors. Um, the, the, anything you can learn ahead of time before you come in is wonderful. And if you've learned all that ahead of time and you did all your research on, say, a basset hound and you walk in and find a Siamese that steals your heart, adopt the Siamese. Take it home. So I'm not advocating that you ignore it. I'm just saying that all the research helps. And if you don't have time for that research, be sure immediately to reach out afterwards because the, re the, um, the support is there. And that is what we found the biggest um, hindrance to pet ownership or the reason for relinquishment is there's a lack of access to those resources. And so we wanna make sure with the broadest audience possible, that those resources are available. The stores provide them, the rescue groups, you provide them. Um, be sure to reach out before you decide to give up on a pet because there are a lot of professionals that want to help you. Sure, well, we have this great little clip I wanna show of um, two cats that were adopted from a PetSmart Charities Adoption Center. Um, their names were Crunch and Moose, and these were some bonded cats, which is something that um, I just love when people adopt a bonded pair. Um, so let's watch this quick clip of Crunch and Moose uh, finding their forever family. I get like a tear in my eye watching, like literally I get a tear in my eye watching videos of cats finding their people. And um, it's just, it's such a beautiful thing. And I do love that there is that feeling of support afterwards. Um, that's big for my adoption programs too, is, you know, I want to make sure people feel like they have the follow-up support. Is there anything in place in terms of um, like continued uh, training or supplies or access to education that PetSmart Charities does for their um, uh, people who adopt from their rescue groups? What other supports are in place? So we have, um, we mainly support the rescue groups that are, are in our locations to provide that support to those adoptive parents. And we have a wide variety of grant categories where uh, the donations given by the customers go to support the education programs that those agencies provide. So uh, we recognize that there are a lot of barriers to access to veterinary care. There are barriers to keeping the pet in the home during struggling times. Um, and so we have grant categories that specifically address those issues. And we have them for rescues and shelters as well to build their educational systems and their programs so that they can provide that post adoption support. So the stores can provide, the PetSmart stores can provide the, the products and the things needed to keep that cat healthy uh, throughout its lifetime. But the uh, emotional support and the nutrition or the um, behavioral support really can be provided by those rescue groups and those partners. Um, but this is a, a really good time to recognize that the reason that support is available is because those customers that come into PetSmart that leave $1 or $2 at the register make that impact. Millions of dollars, $40 million that we gave away last year was given away because of those $1 and $2 donations by those customers. And that's why it's so wonderful to um, do these types of interviews to really show, look at the impact your dollar did. Um, that $1 you gave resulted in over 650,000 lives changed last year. Those are homes that brought a pet home that are forever changed because they brought that pet home because you decided to leave $1 at the register. That's how powerful that is. And so um, any amount that, they, that, that the customer leaves when they come in goes to support the very questions you ask is that, how do we keep the pets in the home? How do we offer those support systems? It's $1 at a time, it's $2 at a time. And it just cannot thank those customers enough that come in to help us provide those support systems for you and, and all the other pet parents. I love that. And it's such an easy thing to do. It's like the click of a button makes no big difference to, you know, if I'm donating a dollar, two dollars, five dollars when I'm buying my cat litter um, from a PetSmart, you know, I think that before I met you and before I really knew, um, you know, your whole team, 
I didn't realize all of the different types of programs that you guys do because it's not just the adoption centers. And like you said, you know, there are the adoption centers. That's one thing. But there's also all of this additional support that you guys are doing for um, the rescue groups that you partner with. And I know that um, right now is a really challenging time, obviously, uh, for everyone and uh, certainly for rescue groups. Uh, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about like, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted your partner groups? How has it impacted um, your adoption centers? And uh, what what is PetSmart Charities doing to, you know, kind of step up during this difficult time? So, so the COVID did really uh, make it a struggle for our partners, and especially some of the smaller groups that struggled to help fund the PPE and the, the equipment they needed to be able to continue their life-saving efforts. So um, some of these groups live on a very shoestring budget uh, and their adoptions and the uh, financial rewards we provide are one of their sole source of income. So it became a very big struggle for them to be able to continue to provide that care. Um, I will say that as a country, uh, we really stepped up in the foster category and we really did see um, the pet loving community step up and help foster a lot of these animals that were in shelters that didn't have the visibility anymore. And so PetSmart Charities, um, as soon as the quarantine started getting in, uh, put into place, immediately committed up to a million dollars to these rescue groups specifically to address the COVID-19 issues that they were running into. And so that meant addressing the things they needed to be able to provide the pets the care, as well as the support systems for those that got infected by the virus and couldn't care for their pets but wanted their pets back. And so that's one of the keys for us is how do we keep the pet in the home even during struggling times because relinquishment um, is breaking up the family and a pet is part of the family and we don't wanna do that. So we wanna be able to provide those support systems. And for us, a lot of times that means providing financial support to the rescue groups and the animal shelters that create programs that allow them to keep the pets in the home and to create foster programs so that if you were to get sick, you could give your animals to one of these professionals and they would be able to hold it for you until you got better. Um, and that doesn't just mean COVID. That could be temporary hospitalization. That could be military deployment. You know, there's a lot of reasons you might need to be separated from your pet. And in the past, that might meant relinquishing ownership. It doesn't have to be that way. The pet is part of the family. And through the donations that are given to us through the customers and that we are able to um, put back into this programming, we are able to start creating ways to keep these pets in the home. One thing that, that I've been really proud of PetSmart and PetSmart Charities for is we try to stay right on the edge of innovation. We try to stay just ahead of where the industry is and where it's going. And it's because we have this national view of everything going on in the animal shelter and rescue community. And so this type of programming that we've moved into over the last three or four years is really to address these issues that are becoming very, very visible right now, which is, um, people experiencing homelessness, people experiencing temporary separation from their pets or financial difficulties that might make them give up their pet or uh, in, the, in the worst case scenario, I'm like euthanasia and have to get pet because they feel like they can't fix a broken leg or an injury that has happened. And so to be able to provide funds for those shelters to fix the pet rather than have such a negative outcome is just, it's what it's all about. It's what working at charities is, is for. It's what uh, the animal rescue and sheltering community is moving into appropriately, because that is where the country needs us right now. And so we really wanna stay ahead of that and provide all those resources as best we can um, to continue to stay innovative in, in this space. I absolutely agree. And I'm so grateful that you're in the position that you're in because you have, you know, the background of working in the shelters and with the rescue groups, but then you do have this, you know, big kind of national perspective. Um, and that's, you know, exactly the, the world that I love occupying too, is being able to, you know, know what it takes to do the work on the ground, but also to be able to see what's going on from like a, a 
bird's eye view and to see the direction that our country needs to go into. And I'm just so grateful um, for the work that you do and that PetSmart Charities does. Um, I do end all of my conversations with a would you rather question. So I have one for you. It's, um, it's a very silly question and don't take it too seriously. Um, but it's about adoptions. So this is my would you rather question for you. All things, you know, considered, obviously I know that you uh, are into open adoptions and you would adopt to anybody, but if you had a foster cat um, who you were going to adopt to somebody, would you rather adopt a cat to Superman or to Batman? Who do you think would be, or if you would adopt to both, what do you think would be a perk of being a cat adopted by Superman or Batman? Who would you adopt to? Going to Batman would have more fun because all those webs create a lot of things to play with uh, there. So as far as the cat activity, um, I think the cat would enjoy being with Batman. Um, not sure how cats feel about flying. So I don't know if uh, the Superman side, that could be a little tricky. Um, I think that both of them would end up taking the cape and being the superhero and making the other one stay at home and then they would go out and solve the crimes most likely. And probably then blame the dogs. I love that. Yeah, I love that. I was trying to think of how I would answer this one. And I'm like, you know, I think both of them would be great adopters. Um, I think that, you know, Superman by day has a little bit more of like a standard lifestyle. Well, I feel like Batman has a lot of cool gadgets. So maybe some really fun tech for the cats. Um, <laughs> but um, of course, anybody who wants to adopt a cat, we want them to be able to make that connection. Um, so Steve, I'm so grateful for our conversation. Where can people go to learn more about PetSmart Charities and how to get involved? PetSmartCharities.org. So go to our website. Um, if you're interested in adopting or if you're interested in, in volunteering with a rescue organization or even finding a pet, you can search for a pet from the website. If you're an adoption group, um, you can learn about the granting opportunities and you can learn about uh, the adoption opportunities that we have available. Um, so please go to the website, learn all about PetSmart Charities and reach out. We have relationship managers um, and they're, they're appropriately titled for that reason. We are big into relationships. Um, this is a people industry as well as an animal industry. And so if you have questions, call, reach out. We're happy to do it old fashioned on the phone. You know, we, we do emails as well, but we, we'd love to talk to you. We love to talk to people about animal welfare and we love to talk to rescue groups and shelters about what they're doing. So, so please reach out and, and we're happy to help. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Steve, for all of the good work you're doing. It was really fun talking to you and I hope you have a great day. Yes, you too. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my gosh, uh, Steve is awesome and they do such great work over at PetSmart Charities. Um, but I'm really excited to bring on my next guests. Um, we're going to be talking about what happens after adoption, which is that you got to take your cat to the vet. Um, so my next guests are Dr. Tanika Bautista. She is the Director of Veterinary Quality for Banfield Pet Hospitals. And I'm also joined by Dr. Kirk, Kirk Bruninger. Uh, he is the Director of Strategic Planning for Banfield Pet Hospitals. They're doing great work to make veterinary care more accessible for uh, cat adopters. So let's watch this quick clip about Banfield. We're here for all of the high jumping, ball chasing, catnip loving, Toy swatting, zoomy running pets. For all of the kitty bays, doggy BFFs, the little cuddle bugs, the purrers, and the waggers. From the kitty sneezing to the hairballing, to the cone of shamers, to the just watching their waiters, the little puppers, growing up to be big puppers. We're here for pets and the people who love them. We're Banfield Pet Hospital. Be with us. Be here. Okay, welcome guys. Hello to Dr. Kirk and Dr. B. How's it going, guys? Hi, doing well. <laughs> Hello, Hannah. Thank you for being Great to here. See you. <laughs> Good to see you guys. 
Um, so I'm really excited to chat with you guys all about veterinary care for cats. Uh, the first segment we were talking all about adoptions and so I wanted to start there when you have newly adopted um, a cat or kittens. I know this is something that is going to resonate for you, Dr. B, because you just adopted four kittens. Am I right? That's an amazing uh, amount of kittens. I feel like you must have your hands so full, literally, look at you. Oh my gosh. You've got your hands so full and I know your hands are full, not just with playing and having fun, but also with the, the kind of veterinary care that comes with new kittens. So can you talk about what that's been like for you with your own kittens and, you know, with uh, helping people with new kittens? What are the kind of standard things that you do with a new kitten in terms of veterinary medicine? Yeah, absolutely. It has been such a joy. I'm so glad that we have our kittens. Um, we were fostering them earlier this year, um, <laughs> knowing that the shelters were at capacity and, you know, a lot of kittens were needing homes and my daughter was very passionate about it. So uh, we signed up and um, fortunately, we actually found these kittens from a friend's grandparent. Um, and so we took them all in and it's been a joy having them. They all have special, special personalities um, and we love them so much and we definitely don't want to separate them. Um, oh, so I, I have been bringing them in. <laughs> yeah, I have been bringing them in to get um, their checkups. And I would definitely first suggest that if someone's getting a new kitten, definitely reach out to your veterinarian and find out the best time to bring in your new kitten. Um, and at that time, the doctor will help to um, give you a little bit more specific advice on what next to do. Um, but on the initial visit, there will be a physical examination that's performed. Um, there's definitely blood work involved. Um, also a discussion about how your pet's doing, their energy levels, their eating habits, and things like that. As far as preventive care goes, um, your vet will probably perform some diagnostic tests, including checking your kidney um, stool sample. Uh, for and also looking at their fur coat for external parasites, fleas, and then um, people. So internal and external parasite prevention is going to be important. Um, also, your vet might recommend a. Um, test to screen your cat for common feline viral infections. And so all of the kittens did receive um, that screen as well. Um, if it's not already been performed, your veterinarian might recommend that. Also vaccinations, of course, are very, very important. So um, a part of preventive care, um, if the kittens have already had vaccines, they would get boosters or at that, at that first visit, um, that would initiate their series, and then they would probably get boosters at their follow-up visits. And then a conversation about spaying and neutering is also going to occur. So if your cat has not yet been spayed or neutered, the vet will help you determine when the appropriate time for that is. And my kittens are actually coming up on time to get that done. And also um, talking about dental oral health care, um, helping to... Um, Find ways to keep your cat's teeth and gums healthy and also definitely behavior um, is another important area of preventive care so your veterinarian can advise on the um, best way to keep your home safe and cat friendly as well. Wow well that sounds like a lot and I think that that's why it is so important that if you've adopted a new cat whether it's an adult cat or a kitten or two or three or four kittens um, you know you definitely want to bring them in and establish that vet relationship right away. Even if, of course, you think your cats are healthy, your new kittens are healthy, so important to go in because you can get all those diagnostics and you can get all of the preventative care and the education, as you mentioned. Um, you know, what an opportunity to do everything right from the very beginning. So those kittens are so lucky to be with someone as knowledgeable as you. I love all these photos. I could look at them all day. Um, so, so cute. Um, but I want to talk to um, Dr. Kirk. You also have some cats at home. And of course, you know, uh, even after 
a kitten's first visits, they go in and have those, you know, um, early conversations, that early preventative care. There is, you know, follow up that you need to do with your cats, even if they seem healthy, right? Um, and one of the things that everybody should be thinking about with their cats as time goes on is, is staying up to date on vaccines. I would love if you could um, talk about, you know, what you do with your cats, and I would love to see your cats. Um, and, you know, what do you do with your cats? They're they so sweet. Uh, and what do you recommend in terms of like a vaccination schedule? What vaccines are uh, important for people to be thinking about? And just really talk about the importance of keeping your cats vaccinated. Absolutely. Well, and vaccines are probably one of the most important things that we can do for our cats' health care, just because they prevent so many serious diseases. Uh, and when we think about vaccines, we think of them as what are the core vaccines that every cat should be getting? And then what are the vaccines that um, may be important for cats depending on their lifestyle? And so the core vaccines that every cat should be getting, the first one would be rabies. And that's the only vaccine that's actually required by law. And we typically vaccinate, uh, depending on the state law, uh, after 13 weeks of age, and then at one year of age, and then it could be every three years after that. The other one is the feline uh, distemper vaccine or the FVRCP. And what that stands for is feline viral rhinotracheitis, which is one serious disease, Khaleesi virus, uh, another serious disease, and panleukopenia. And those are three diseases that are um, very ubiquitous in the environment, but very easily prevented with this vaccine, which is why we start giving those vaccines so early. So as soon as they wean off the mother, actually, we begin giving those vaccines. And we usually vaccinate till about 16 weeks of age, again at one year, and then three years after that. So those are the two real core vaccines that we recommend for cats and that I do with my cats as well. Um, the other vaccine that a lot of people have probably heard about is the feline leukemia vaccine. And that tends to be very lifestyle dependent vaccine. So particularly if you have a cat that's um, an indoor outdoor cat, maybe interacting with cats with unknown feline leukemia status, uh, then they would be uh, really important to get that vaccine. It's important that we also test for feline leukemia prior to giving that vaccine because the vaccine will actually cause a false a positive test result after giving it as well. And so we wanna be sure that we know they're negative before that. Sure, I really appreciate all that information. And I think it is important for people to have that relationship with the vet where they can discuss things like lifestyle. But of course, I wanna drive home the point of like that FBRCP vaccine and the rabies vaccine, that's important even for an indoor cat, right? Um, you know, why, why would you say, um, that it's important even for an indoor cat. Can you talk about that a little? Absolutely. So even for an indoor cat, those are uh, microbes basically that they can get exposed to even in our house. So they don't have to come in direct contact with another pet that has that disease to get it because they can actually survive in the environment. We can bring those things into the house. And I already mentioned rabies is required by law. That disease doesn't really survive well in the environment, but that is a huge public health issue for us. And that's why that one's required. Yeah, sure. So it's so important. Of course, right now we're all in a global pandemic together, and I think people are understanding more and more the importance of disease prevention and vaccination. And um, I couldn't agree more strongly that everybody should be getting their cats um, vaccinated for those core uh, those core vaccines. So let's talk um, a little bit about microchips. I want to switch to um, you, Dr. B. Can you talk to me about microchips? Um, it's something I'm super passionate about and not just microchipping, but the importance of registering your microchip because a lot of people at that first kitten appointment, they get the microchip and then they never register it. So talk a little about that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm passionate about microchips as well. And all of my kittens will be getting microchips this month. So even though they do wear a collar and they um, have identification and the phone number there, that can get lost. And the microchip is a benefit because it's permanent. It's a permanent way to identify our pets. And it actually goes right in between the shoulder blades. And that can be placed at the veterinary facility. And once that microchip is in place, it's really super important to keep the 
information up to date, um, the contact information for the clients and the family up to date, because if for any reason um, there's an unfortunate situation where the kitten is or cat is lost, or even, of course, for dogs, um, if they are lost and um, they are found, the most common um, thing that will happen then when they are brought into a veterinary facility or a shelter is that they'll get scanned. And once that microchip scan is performed, it can actually be a great way to identify their family in their home. Um, and so I actually do know of a story um, that happened recently where a cat was found by a Good Samaritan and brought into one of our Banfield Pet Hospital locations. And they scanned the cat and they did identify the family and they contacted the family. The family came right in immediately and they were reunited. And it was a, a wonderful, heartwarming experience. And of course, nobody ever wants to lose their pet, but because of the fact that they were registered and their account was active and updated, they were able to be reunited. And it turns out that cat traveled about 30 miles during the time that he was away from his family. So it was a pretty wow. significant amount of um, travel that the cat, um, you know, experienced that during is. that time too. So absolutely microchips are very important, yes. Yeah, I always, you know, make sure that obviously our, our kittens that we adopt out are all microchipped. And then I tell people you have to register them and you have to keep it up to date because um, you know, like you said, veterinary clinics, shelters, even rescues, like I keep a microchip scanner here. I keep one in my car cause I find dogs all the time. And I can't tell you how many times I've scanned an animal and they're, they're microchipped, but the microchip is not registered anywhere. And then I have to go on like a, it's like a adventure expedition trying to figure out like, okay, where did this microchip come from? Can we find any details about the family? Um, or if the info is not kept up to date, we have to really, really look for that person. So um, yeah, definitely so important. Now, um, a big issue that I think is really, really great that's starting to become, um, it's great that it's becoming more discussed is the issue of cats really not getting the same level of veterinary um, exposure, people bringing their cat to the vet as dogs. Um, I know that there are uh, some pretty staggering statistics out there, more than half of cats not receiving uh, regular veterinary care. Dr. Kirk, is that something that you have experienced? And, um, you know, what would you say about, um, you know, why do you think that uh, people are not bringing their cats to the vet as often as uh, people are bringing dogs. Yeah, that's something I've absolutely experienced in the clinic before. It's, you know, most of the patients that are coming through that we typically see are dogs as opposed to cats. Um, and the American Veterinary Medical Association actually did a study on what is the percentage of, what's the cat to dog ratio that's out there. And it's about 60% dogs, about 40% cats that are in the general population. Uh, but that's not really what we see in our clinics. So as a whole, we've seen about 80% of the visits that come through are uh, dogs and about 20% tend to be cats. So we know there's a huge opportunity for us to give better care to our, our feline friends. Um, some of the reasons behind that, one, I think it's the access to care for cats or the ease of getting access to care for cats. We all know it can be very frustrating to get your cat in the box and actually take them to the, uh, the veterinary hospital and then you're feeling bad because they're anxious, you're feeling anxious and you know it's, it makes for a very difficult situation. Um, so, uh, and a lot of hospitals now, thankfully, are implementing other strategies to help remove that anxiety for cats and make it much more welcoming environment for them. And so they do a fear-free philosophy. And so um, they keep cats in a quiet area, a calming environment. They use pheromone sprays to help with that calming. Even the handling practices are much more deliberate in those cases as well, uh, really to try and give the best experience possible to cats. Um, I think some of the other reasons we see is one, uh, not everybody understanding really that importance of the preventive care and how that can lead to um, better health lifelong for, for your pet. Um, and that can play out with, you know, as simple as just identifying parasites. 
you know, we see cats all the time that come in and they say, oh, we've just been having hairballs. And then we do a fecal sample and find out, nope, there were parasites there. And this is actually something we can treat and take care of and provide a better quality of life. And then I think the third reason is, is cats are very good about hiding a lot of their clinical signs. And so it can take a real professional to actually do a thorough physical exam, look at blood work, um, look at a urinalysis, understand, is there something more going on here? And so a cat may, you know, an owner may report something as simple to us, like, oh, it just seems, you know, they've been um, much more tired recently or not jumping up on things as much recently. And that may signal us to say, oh, there may actually be arthritis going on here. And that's something that we can help to provide better quality of care with. Or they've been losing weight and we don't understand, we haven't changed the diet or um, anything like that. And there may be a dental disease that's making them not want to eat as much, or there may be some other issue going on. And so, uh, and so it's really important to always partner with your veterinarian whenever you see these subtle changes occur. And even if you don't see those subtle changes occur, it may be something that a veterinarian can pick up on physical exam. Sure. Yeah, thank you. And Dr. B, do you want to add anything to that in terms of you know, I, I love what was just mentioned about how there are things that people experience with their cat that they don't see as a health problem that actually may be a sign of a health problem. Things like those physical changes or behavioral changes. Uh, one thing I hear a lot is, um, you know, oh, the cat's peeing outside of the box because they hate me. That was one thing I, I uh, one time experienced a, an adopter saying, you know, the kitten they had adopted from me a year previous, they're, they're urinating outside of the box because they're, they have a behavior problem. And I said, did you go to the vet yet? Well, it turned out that that, that kitten had an infection that needed to be treated. Um, so, you know, can you talk a little bit about some of the things that you see that are a big deal that maybe people don't even notice is a big deal? You know, what should people be looking out for? Yeah, absolutely. And I really appreciate that story because that is a common one, Hannah, where um, cats are urinating outside of the box. And really, any time that a cat is demonstrating an abnormal behavior, something that's just not typical, um, you know, we haven't seen them act this way before at home, um, you know, whether it's urinating outside of the box or maybe even acting aggressive, those can be signs of a medical condition. Um, and definitely bringing in your cat to the vet to have an assessment and just discuss the behavior and what's changed, what's different. Um, can cue the veterinarian to maybe have some ideas about what to look for and what to rule out. So for example, urinating outside of the box can definitely be uh, directly a urinary tract condition um, involving the bladder. It could be a metabolic condition, it could be several things. And similarly, aggression that I mentioned, it might mean that maybe the cat's in pain, you know, as opposed to having a um, actual fear or dominant type of aggressive behavior. It might be signs of, uh, you know, discomfort. So anytime anything is um, different, appetite changes, um, changes in the amount of water that's being taken in, changes in where the cat's sleeping and, and what surfaces the cat is getting up on um, in the frequency sometimes of that. Um, sleeping habits, you know, those kind of things can actually be indications of a condition that the cat might be developing that the veterinarian can help um, to figure out what's going on. Yeah, I really agree that I think, you know, there are so many things that people see as either not a big deal or, um, you know, as a just a behavioral problem. But what's important for people to remember is, you know, cats can't speak to you. Like your can't, cat can't say to you like, hey, I, you know, don't want to use the litter box right now because it's really uncomfortable for me. And I, so I feel scared. Something's hurting for me. Can you get me, you know, seen by a doc? Like they can't ask that. So what can they do? They can go, you know, pee on your laundry and then you go, oh, you're having a, you know, a behavioral problem, but actually they're telling you I need to see a vet. Um, so I think that that is, uh, mm -hmm. such an important, such an important thing for people to know. Um, Dr. Kirk, there are a lot of things that influence well-being aside from just, you know, veterinary medicine. And there are things that, um, 
you know, that go into a healthy cat that anybody can be doing at home, things like nutrition, things like um, lifestyle, uh, exercise. Can you talk a little bit about the different aspects of life that, um, that people with cats should be thinking of um, in terms of how they can stay healthy? Absolutely. Well, you hit on a couple of the biggest ones. So nutrition is something that, you know, we use for so much. It's not just we're giving them food because they're hungry. It's also we give them treats or a reward. And there's so many components to that. And, um, and with nutrition, when we think about the different lifestyles, there's different needs throughout each phase of life. So I'll talk about my cats, for example. So I have a cat that's under one year of age. So she's getting, uh, she's getting kitten food right now. And then I also have a four-year-old cat that I, uh, we adopted actually because uh, he was relinquished because of behavioral urination. And so we've done a lot of the testing mm. and so we know it's in fact a behavioral issue. Well, he receives a prescription diet. So we offer him the Royal Canin Calm diet. Um, because we didn't want to go to a oh, medication to help that. I love yeah. that <laughs> diet. I'm sorry to interrupt, but like <laughs> my cat Eloise is on that diet and it has been life changing for her. She's not on it for urinary issues, but she's on it for like, she's a very anxious and kind of shy cat and that calm diet. Oh my gosh. It's like a, it's a miracle, but please continue. <laughs> Yeah, and we've also seen a lot of great improvement uh, in the urination here for us too. Uh, but it really speaks to that point that you need individualized nutrition depending on the pet's needs, depending on the cat's lifestyle. Uh, and so there's a lot of components to that. And so particularly as they age, um, we may see other types of diseases occur and we can actually help uh, treat or maintain the progression of those diseases with different types of diets that can help. Uh, and then the second point you hit on, also extremely important, which is the activity and the exercise for cats. Uh, I don't know that a lot of people understand how such small changes in, uh, in playing with your cat. So even if you play, you know, five to 10 minutes more per day, how that subtle change can have such a dramatic impact, even just in controlling their weight. And so it's very important that we continue to socialize our cats, that we continue to give them outlets and give them exercise uh, so they can maintain that healthy weight. And, uh, and my last point I'll just say around weight is that can lead to a lot of other health issues. I mentioned arthritis earlier. It can also be a contributor to diabetes as well and uh, many other health conditions. And so it's very important that we keep our cats at the appropriate weight and you can do that through exercise and nutrition. And it's fun to play with your cat, right? A lot of us yes, are at, at home right now and we have a little bit extra time. So, you know, I think I'm definitely usually not home as much as I have been lately. And I'm sort of feeling that like, oh man, when you're stuck in a house, you really want more things to do. And it makes me I'm more empathetic with my cats. They probably being at home all the time, they want more stuff to do. We're playing with our cats all the time here. Uh, it's as fun for me as it is for them. So, and it's obviously really healthy for them too. So my last question is really about kind of how right now during this time, we're seeing a lot of people making the decision to adopt. People are, you know, staying at home, they're bringing home a new friend, but also we are um, experiencing um, a real difficult time um, economically in this country right now. I know for a lot of people uh, bringing home a new cat, one concern is the cost of vet care. Um, it's not always an affordable thing for people to access. And so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or um, advice on how people can, you know, can mitigate those, those expenses and how can people, uh, you know, confidently adopt a cat knowing that they will be able to afford to give them the veterinary care that they need. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that is a great question and so important because as we talk about preventive care, and keeping our cats healthy and bringing them in for the visits that are recommended on the frequency that they're recommended. Um, it's definitely important for our pet owners to be able to be confident with um, being able to afford that. And so at Banfield Pet Hospital, we offer optimum wellness plans. And that is a package of preventative care 
And it is actually, it allows that pet and that client to get the care on the very first day and then have monthly installments um, for the care that's provided. And then it renews annually. And it definitely makes the preventive care much more affordable and accessible. And it gives peace of mind to our pet owners that they will be able to approve what the doctor is recommending and advocating for for their pet. So optimum wellness plans are a really great option. And um, in addition to that, the optimum wellness plan also supports visits that may not include preventive care. It also includes unlimited office visits. So it really brings a lot of peace of mind to our, our pet owners. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, I always close out with a fun, silly question. So this is my silly, would you rather question for both of you? Okay. Um, don't take it too seriously, but I'd love to hear your, your answer to my, would you rather question? So the question is, would you rather have a magic wand that can fix any broken bone or would you rather have a magic potion that can make any cat speak English for five minutes to tell you all about what's going on with them? Uh, let's start with Dr. Kirk. Which one would you choose? You know, I think I would like to do the potion because my little kitten is always talking to me and I just want to know what she's saying. So that's what I would go with. <laughs> what about you, Dr. B? That is so tempting. Um, I think I would go with the magic wand because of the broken bones. You know, I feel like if I have the power to heal that with just a swipe of a wand and reduce pain, <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, and so uh, I would probably use that all the time. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. That was great answers. I don't know that I would, I don't know which one I would choose. They're both awesome. Of course, I would always love to be able to talk to my cats too. So, um, but thank you so much for answering all of my questions, both the serious and the silly ones. Um, can you guys share any information about where people can go to find out more about um, Banfield or about uh, the work that you guys are doing? If anybody wants to find out more, they can go to Banfield.com. Uh, and if they haven't been to one of our hospitals before, they can get a coupon for a free office visit there. They can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at the handle of Banfield Pet Hospital. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. I really appreciate the work you're doing. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Bye, guys. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank bye. you so much. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> All right. Well, that was very informative. I really appreciate uh, Dr. Kirk and Dr. B for joining me. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining. I do want to mention that right now you can get a free vet visit from Banfield just by buying your favorite Royal Canin food at PetSmart. Um, you can hop on to royalcanin.com slash cat health to learn more about that and all of the different ways you can get greater access to veterinary care through the Take Your Cat to the Vet campaign. Uh, and be sure to tune in next week because I have a really exciting guest. It is the amazing Sassy Walker. You might know her from the documentary, The Cat Rescuers. She does really incredible work. So definitely you will not want to miss that one. So that's all for now. Stay curious, stay compassionate, and join me next week for another episode of Kitten Lady and Friends.